start and recording. Okay, so we are recording right now. All right. So first thing first, I want to talk about the solution of the homework assignment because I think more than one person kind of wonders about the correct answers to that one. So we'll go ahead and talk about the function assignment. And I'll go into preview mode. So this is going to be about the same as what you see. All right, so the questions basically use a bit field or bit uh, field method to encode whether f is a function. If f is a function, add 1 to the result. Um, if f is a function and is also injective, add 2. And if f is a function and also surjective, add 4. So you can have 0 as a possible answer if f is not even a function to begin with. You can have just one as a result if f is a function, but it is not injective nor surjective. You can have uh, three as a possible answer because it is a function and it's also injective. Or you can have five if it is a function and it is surjective but not injective. Or you can have seven when it is a bijection. So those are the possibilities. You should not have two or four on its own because you, um, if you answer if you have two, it means it's already a function, which means your one also applies. So two and four and six, those are impossible answers. All of the other ones should be possible. All right, so let's take a look at just this one. Zero, zero, one, two, two, two. And your domain is zero, one, two, and codomain is y, which is zero, one, two as well. So what about this one? Is it a function? Yes. Okay. Is it a injection? Yeah. No. It is not an injection because one and two from the domain, they both map to two in the codomain. And then the third question is, is it a surjection? It is not a surjection because one in the codomain is not mapped to. So the correct answer to this one should be a one. It is just a function. Okay, <clears throat> next. All right, so with this one, we have uh, the domain being 0, 1, 2 as a set, and then the codomain being 0, 1, 2, 3 as a set. And then the function is 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 2. It is a function because you know, we can see that 0, 1, 2 from the domain, each one maps to one and only one element in the codomain. It is not an injection because 0 maps to 2 and 2 also maps to 2. It is also not a surjection because there are two elements in the codomain that are not mapped to being 0 and 1. So once again, the answer is just 1 in this case. Any questions? Nope. Okay, all right, moving on. <clears throat> okay, this is question number 3. This one is not even a function, so we put a 0 here. It is not a function because it... There are two reasons, okay? You can give one or the other reason that this is not even a function. If you look at how one is mapped, it is not mapped. Or you can say it maps to nothing. You know, one, dom you know, one element in the domain maps to no element in the codomain. So that's one reason. But you can also look at two because two maps to two different elements in the codomain that also violates the, um, you know, the requirement to be a function. So this one is definitely not a function. So put a zero here. And then with this one, it is not a function because you know, once again, we have two elements in, we have the same element in the domain map to <laughs> the same element in the codomain. It is still not a function. It is not even a set to begin with. Now, if you say, but tech, you know, this is a, uh, if you look at the duplicate element and just remove one of them, it is still not a function because one does not map to anything. So any way you look at this, it cannot be a function. So put a zero here. And in number five, there we go. This is a function, okay, because all elements in the domain map to one and only one element in the codomain. It is not an injection because zero and two both map to the same element in the codomain, which is two. And it is also not a surjection because one and two in the codomain are not being used. So that means it is just one because it's just a function. And then this one is a 
function. It is also not a injection nor a surjection because you know you can see how one and two they both map to one, and then the element two in the codomain is not mapped to. So once again, the answer is just one in this case. And then with this one, we got zero. Okay, so this is a function. Okay, so we have at least one. But once again, it is not an injection nor a surjection. So it's just a one. I believe that is the case. So we'll see. Uh, what am I getting? Okay, one out of one, one out of one, one out of one, one out of one, one out of one. One out of one, one out of one. Yep, so that's it. Any questions coming out of this particular homework assignment? Did it help you study? Did it help you go like, I really have to think about this? So it depends, okay? All of these things are randomized. So it really depends on which problem set you get. You know, depending, you know, so some people may have a seven, okay? You may get a bijection by chance. Some people may get a five, you know, some people may get a three, you know, some people may have all zeros, okay? It's possible, unlikely, but it's possible. It took me a long time to coerce uh, Canvas, you know, to actually make questions like these um, because, you know, it just has a you know, back end of random number generation. Then I have to use math operators alone to decide whether something is injective or subjective or bijective. Yeah, it's interesting. And I hate it. <laughs> Once I figure out how to do it, and it's really tedious, I do not like it. But just to figure out how to do it the first time was kind of fun. All right. Any questions about functions? Any question about olive null, what it means, you know, what the G function is, and how to use the inverse function and stuff like that? No questions? Okay. Well, if there are no questions, we're going to move on. All right. So we were talking about relations, and we were just ending the discussion of partial ordering, which means, you know, we can, we can tell how something is relating to other things, but not everything relates to everything. So in the, ga in the case of this particular example, um, we have two things that are not related in any way. Um, so the, uh, the idea is you know, we want to use the relation of at least as desirable as, okay, which is alada, okay? So we can spell out you know, all the four elements and how they relate to each other. So you know, smooth and rich is alada, you know, smooth and rich because they're the same. Alada means you know, at least as desirable as, okay? And then we have we have two things that are not related in this case, which is between smooth and not rich, and not smooth but rich. So between those two, we cannot determine which one is a lot of which one. There's no relationship between those two. So is that okay? Do you guys kind of vaguely remember this example? Okay. So the importance of ordering is when you want to sort an array, partial ordering is not enough, okay? If you have a relation that is only partial ordering and you're given an array and your, your job is to sort the array, partial ordering is not enough for that. Because you can end up with elements where you cannot really determine, uh, should this one go before this one or the other way around? And you simply do not have the information to say one way or the other which also means you know, there's no way to keep the array quote-unquote sorted because a sorted array means you know, everything has to be quote-unquote less than or equal to the next one or greater than or equal to the next one. So that means you know, partial ordering is kind of cool, but we need total ordering in order for a sorting algorithm to work. So a total ordering means you know, it is almost exactly the same thing as partial ordering. You still need R to be reflexive. You still need R to be anti-symmetric. You still need R to be transitive. But there's one more thing that you need, which is R has to be comparable over X. And then the uh, math equation to express your know, comparable is this. For every way to choose values, E and F, 
meaning and having the constraint that whatever value you choose, it has to be an element of x. This or has to be true. So that means you know, ERF or FRE. Okay, we don't need both to be true. Okay, in fact, you can get into a lot of trouble if you make both to be true, because if both are true for certain things, then it is not going to be anti-symmetric. So we just need one or the other. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay. So we'll go ahead and construct um, total ordering, and let's see how we can make something that's totally ordered. Let me uh, prepare the tablet first, and then we'll use some examples. This is ESP440. Make a new notepad. Okay. So I need to start up the, uh, the notepad on this side. SCRC. So we, we will take a few take a look at a few examples. Uh, we'll make oops, I'm using the wrong tool. All right, so we have x having the usual. Okay, so let's just say zero, one, two. Okay, that's fine. Okay, but remember we are not looking at less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. I'm just randomly defining you know relation between the elements. Okay, so in order for R to be um, totally ordered, I know I need a few, you know, a few are necessary. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, they all need to be here. Why? Okay, let me go back to the slide, to, the, to this part here. Why do I always need 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2 in this case? Mm -hmm. Because of the last thing needs to be comparable. No, no, it's not the last one. Okay, so you have to go back and think about the definitions of what is reflexive, what is anti-symmetric, and what is transitive. It's one of those three. Why do we need 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2 to be here? The definition of reflexive. The definition of reflexive, very good. Okay, so... <clears throat> if you have not written down the definition of reflexive on your own notes that you are going to use as your you know, notes, you know, your study guide for exam two, you might want to do that, okay? Maybe not during class, but after class, you might want to put all the definitions to one single place so it's easier for you to find them. Okay, in order for relation R to be reflexive over X, then you have to say this whole thing has to be true for every way to choose e as a as a, you know, to be an element of x. E e has to be in R, which means every element of x has to relate to itself in R. Is that okay? So that is the reason why in our example, zero zero, which you know, means zero relates to itself, one one, which means one relates to itself. And 2, 2, which means 2 is relating to itself, they all need to be here in order to be reflexive. Okay, so we pause here and then we ask about the other two requirements just to be partially ordered. So, to be partially ordered, you also need um, the relation to be anti symmetric. So, the, qu the question is is it anti symmetric as it is right now? Okay, so. The answer to the question is, okay, what is the definition of anti being anti-symmetric? So we have to remember how to look it up and how to read the definition. So symmetri symmetric is not used in this case. Um, so we are looking up anti-symmetric here. So anti-symmetric is one of the weird ones because it says for, e, for all EF in X, in other words, for all the ways to instantiate E as an element of X, and for all the ways to instantiate F as an element of X, EF 
is in R and Fe is in R implies E and F are the same. Okay. So the best way to look at this is to say, can I find a reason to say that this R is not anti-symmetric? In other words, can I find a way to make this implication false? Okay, are we good so far? You, can you guys remember you know, this portion here? Okay, so now I switch back to this example here. Given the only elements in the relation R is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, can I make that implication false? Nope. Okay, so it is anti-symmetric as it is right now. What about transitive? Is the relation currently transitive? So how, what, does trans, what does transitive look like as a definition? So we go back to here, we look at transitive. So in order to define being transitive, we need three quantified variables, EFG. So for every way to find a value for E, a value for F, and a value for, of G, so that they are all elements of X, they can be the same, okay? Or two of them can be the same, the third one being different. So for every single way to instantiate a value in E, F, and G, can we guarantee that this implication is true? Okay, we have EF in R and FG in R, and that implies EG is also in R. Okay, so once again, you, know, you can look at it from the perspective of making sure all the ways of choosing EF and G will make the implication true. You can also look at it from the opposite perspective of can I find a counterexample where the implication is false? Because all you need is at least one counterexample then the entire you know, universally quantified statement is false. So let me switch back to the example that we're looking at right now. So can you find an example to make this false, to make this not transitive? The answer is no. Okay, it's pretty simple. You know, pretty hard to find a case where it is not true. So that means right now it is already partially ordered. How can you sort, okay? the values 0, 1, and 2, when you can only define that 0 relates to 0, 1 relates to 1, and 2 relates to 2. There's no way to sort an array when you only have these elements here, because there's no ordering between 1 and 2, there's no ordering between 1 and 2 and 0, and so on. Okay, I thought there were some hands, so go ahead. So for the transitive, mm -hmm. uh, what is the case where we have E is 0, F is Zero and G is one. And but you cannot. There's no zero one here either. Yes, no. There's a zero one here, so which means it's not transitive, right? No. Okay. So so let's let's think about that. I, I hope all of you can remember the relation because it's just zero zero one one two two. So we plug in E being zero, F being zero, and G being one into the three variables here. So uh, 0, 0 as a two-tuple is in R, true. Uh, 0, 1 is in R is not true, right? So we have true and false, which is false. But that false is on the left-hand side of the implication. What does that mean? The implication itself is false. Excuse me, it's true, okay? The implication itself is true, which means that is not a counterexample. Mm -hmm. All right, so it has met, okay, so this little simple thing here has met all the requirements to be partially ordered. Strange, right? I mean, there's no actual ordering here, but by definition, it meets all the requirements to be partially ordered. But it's not totally ordered because if I go to the definition of um, comparable, which is down here, I can just say, uh, what if E is 0 and F is 1, okay? If E is 0, F is 1, then 0, R1, which is e, uh, 0, 1 as a 2 tuple, does not exist, right? You know, it's not in, the, in, the, in R. And then F, R, E, which is translates to, in this specific example, 1, R, 0, or 1, 0 as a 2 tuple, is also not in R. So now we have false or false, which means, you know, the disjunction itself is false. Um, that's it. That's all I need. 
because I, I only have to find one counterexample to make the universally quantified statement false. So are we still doing okay so far of why 001122 is not totally ordered. It is partially ordered, but not totally ordered. All right, so how do we make it totally ordered? Well, we can try some really odd ones, okay? So we can say uh, zero relates to two, okay? Don't ask me why, okay? I'm just randomly picking things, okay? So that means, you know, zero and two are now related. I also need zero and one to be related, okay? So let's go zero and one being related like that, okay? And I need one and two to be also related. So I can say one, two, maybe, okay? All right, so now the question is, does that make R totally ordered? Okay, we, we see some people turning their head, okay? So the question is, if it is not, why is it not totally ordered? Okay, so we go back to those three quest four questions now, okay? Three questions for partially ordered, four questions for totally ordered. One, is it still reflexive? Is it reflexive? Okay, let's, let's go back and check the reflexive definition. So the reflexive definition is right here. For every element in X, which means 0, 1, or 2, is that element relating to itself using R? Yes. Yep, okay, so it's still reflexive. Very good. Uh, is it transitive? Okay, this is the tricky one. Your transitive is usually the trickiest because it involves you know, three variables. So we look at this one and ask, okay, for every single way to choose E, F, and G, is it still meeting the requirement of being transitive? And if not, you have to tell me why. Okay. And I believe there's no way to make this, make the statement false for being transitive. Okay, I'll, sh I'll show you an example. Okay, let me show you an example. So in this case, okay, using the transitive field thing, what if E equals to zero, um, F equals to one, and G equals to two? Okay, just a, as an example. So we look at um, zero, one is in R. Yep, it's good. And 1, 2 is in R. Yep, that's good. So that means the entire conjunction is true. Okay. So now the question is, does it imply, because if the left-hand side of an implication is true, then the implication has a chance of being false. Because if the right-hand side is false, then the implication is going to be false. So this time, I really have to make sure the right-hand side is true. So this, does this imply 0, 2 is in R? Yep, the implication is true. Because I can see that you know, 0, 2 is right here. So that means, you know, ha, huh, okay, since this is also true, that means the implication itself is true. It is not a counterexample. So the question is, can you find a way to instantiate the values of E, F, G, so that the implication is false? That's the question. How about that E is 1, F is 2, and G is 0? G is 0? Okay, so let's, let's check out what happens this time. So the first one is asking, is 1, 2 in R? Yes, okay, because we can see 1, 2 is right here. And then we have and, uh, the other one is, what, 2, 0 is in R? The answer is no, right? So, by the way, the and is false. So, since the and is on the left-hand side of the implication, that means the imp implication itself is true. So, this is not a counterexample. So, you can see how this can be a little bit tricky, right? You, you really just have to kind of look at those things and, you know, kind of evaluate and in your mind you have to go like okay what about this what about this what about this and in this case 
it is actually transitive. Okay, so we have met uh, all the, okay, we haven't talked about anti-symmetric yet, so you have to look at the anti-symmetry perspective. So we look at the definition of being anti-symmetric. It is like this one here. EF in R and FE in R implies E and F are the same. And we want to make it false, okay? And every time you want to make an implication false, there's only one way to do it. The left-hand side has to be true. The right-hand side has to be false. So the question is, can you find a case like that? Well, let's think about it, okay? So we can do this in the opposite way because in order for E equals to F to be false, that's easy. E and F are simply different, right? That's all we're looking for. If E and F need to be different, and yet we want EF to be in R and FE to be in R, that means we're looking for something like 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, okay? You know, both of those have to be in the set, or 1, 2, 2, 1, or 0, 2, 2, 0, okay? That sort of stuff. But when you look at the example that we have, we have none of those, okay? Uh, 0, 2 is here, but 2, 0 is missing. 0, 1 is here, but 1, 0 is missing. 1, 2 is here, but 2, 1 is missing. So there's no reason for this to be not anti-symmetric. It is anti-symmetric. Now, if the question is, is it symmetric? Then the answer is no, it is not symmetric. Because in order for this to be symmetric, if 0, 2 is here, then 2, 0 needs to be here too. But being symmetric is not, okay, I emphasize again, is not a requirement to be partially ordered. And since you know, being partially ordered is required for you know, totally ordered, so that means symmetry is actually not really that useful. Yep. Okay, so if it's not useful, then why include it? That is a good question, but I think all textbooks you know, talk about symmetry. So I would suspect that in some situations, you know, symmetry is important. Just not when we define partially ordered versus totally ordered. All right. So are there any questions? All right. So let me just write the conclusion here. So this particular R is totally ordered. Totally ordered which is kind of weird because if you look at it, it's like, why is it totally ordered? I can see, oh, okay, I guess the less than or equal to would do this, right? So if you look at this R as the less than or equal to, that kind of makes sense. Zero, okay, zero is less than or equal to zero. One is less than or equal to one. Two is less than or equal to two. Zero is less than or equal to two. Zero is less than or equal to one. And one is less than or equal to two. Okay, so from that perspective, it kind of makes sense. But I can actually make this totally ordered, but it doesn't make sense from a numerical perspective. Let me show you how we can do that. So we can just kind of flip these two, turn this one into one zero, and then the other one would relate one and two in a particular way. So one, two would work. And 2, 1 would work too. So we can make it like that. It still meets all the requirements. So this relation is by definition still a total order. It is still totally ordered, even though numerically wise, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense. But it checks all the boxes. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys think about this a little bit. Let us sink in a little bit before we move on. So I'll be still convinced that this particular R after the modification is still totally ordered. Check it, right? Is it reflexive? Yep. Is it anti-symmetric? Yes. Is it transitive? See, the transitive is the, is the tricky one. So in this case, you can think about um, 1 as E, 0 as F, and then G as 2. Which means, you know, in that case, oh, okay, it is not transitive. Okay? <laughs> it is not. So this one is not totally ordered. Okay? I will emphasize this is not totally ordered. Because I screwed it up. Does everybody see how I screwed it up? That this is not transitive. Not obvious? Okay. I'll work on this. 
Okay, so let me. Yep. But I, I'll write it out. So I'm going to cut out all this stuff here so that I can you know, start again. So this is not so that this is not as confusing. All right, so I, what I need to do is to choose. I choose. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I choose zero as the connector. So I choose E to be one, F, which is the connector, to be the zero, and then G, which is the other end, to be a two. So under this particular condition, then the first question is one, zero, is in R. Okay, you're good here. And two, zero, two is in R. We're good here. So the conjunction is true. But does it imply 1, 2 is in R? This is false. Because 2 relates to 1, fine, okay, we have the total, uh, we have the comparable part, but 1, 2 is not in R. So now we end up with a, a true implies a false, which means the implication itself is false. So it is not transitive. Mm -hmm. Does the lesson equal always mm -hmm. true? Like, um, for example, I see one zero one is not less than or equal to zero, so I will assume that it's not totally all. Can I just so don't look at it as less than or equal to, because you know that's not that's not what relations you know, necessarily need to be. Okay. Like most of the time, the less than or equal to will be like some kind of verification. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how do I fix this so that it is totally ordered? What do I need to do? Swap one and two. Swap one and two, exactly. So if I exchange the one and two here, then the one, two here will be two, one. And, yep. Actually, I take it back. So swap these two, okay, so it becomes one, two then the, the one, two that I need in order for it to be transitive will be there. But I'm going to leave the example as is to illustrate how this one is not totally ordered because it is not transitive. It, of course, it's also not partially ordered because transitive is also needed in order to be partially ordered. All right. Any questions about relations, you know, or the four properties of relations? Yes? Um, is it true, or, so can a relation only be categorically described as being anti-symmetric or symmetric? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So let's say a, a relation, like, symmetry is like a property of a relation. Yes. Right? And so can it only be anti-symmetric or symmetric? But not both. Yeah, yeah. But oh. those two are the only choices for to describe a relation. Is that correct? No, no, be, no not really. Um, we got reflexive. I mean, just in terms of symmetry. Oh, with the term symmetry in it? Yeah. Yes. So, okay. so at least for this class, we only have symmetric and anti-symmetric as properties that has the term symmetry in it. So if a relation is symmetric, um, or if a relation is not symmetric, it's anti-symmetric. No. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. If it is not symmetric, then it is automatically anti-symmetric. That is true. Okay. Wait, okay, so the rest of the class, okay, what did I just say? <laughs> And why is that the case? How do you know that, right? So what I said is not symmetric implies it has to be anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric. Okay. This is a claim. It's not a proof. So how can you be sure that that is the case? I claim that this implication is always true. Yep. So we'll the okay, so we first you know, start with the definition. Okay, so we can do that. 
So now we go to the definition of symmetry, which is right here, versus anti-symmetric, which is here. So in order for the proof to happen, the first thing is we are negating symmetric here, which means you know, this if and only if is not true for every way that we choose E and F. Actually, I take it back. Okay, my bad, my bad. Okay, so let me go back here, and then we'll say, <laughs> okay. The tech lied. Okay. Can someone say, okay, the tech, you know, I want my refund for this one single class, you know, because you lied to us, you know, to say that not anti and not symmetric implies anti -sym symmetry. So how do you prove me wrong in this case? How do you prove an implication to be wrong? So you go ahead and then you go. Yep. So on the previous example. Mm -hmm. When we have not transitive, when E is one. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with so. transitive. This is only about symmetric versus anti symmetric. Go ahead. So the only way to prove it's false is that the left side be true and the right side be false. Okay, so we want to find a case where it really is not symmetric, but it is also not anti symmetric at the same time. That is the counter example that we need to look for. To prove that I just lied. Is that correct? Okay, so Chris, go ahead. You get oh, your hand I was going to say the same thing he said with the left side being true and the right side being false. Yes, so we have to find an example like that, right? So we have to find a relation like that. So the best way to look at this is to look at examples. Okay, so I'm going to use the same thing. X is 0, 1, 2, as I said. So now we are not concerned about reflexive anymore. Okay, so we don't care. Uh, we are not concerned about transitive. We don't care. We are only concerned about symmetry versus anti-symmetry. So you have to find me something that is not symmetric. Okay. Well, not symmetric is not as easy as you think. Because guess what? This is actually symmetric. The empty relation is automatically symmetric al along with a lot of things. The only thing it is not automatically is reflexive. An empty relation is not automatically reflexive. You guys go like, but I think it is definitely not reflexive. That is not entirely true either. I'll give you an example where you can have an empty relation and yet it is reflexive. You go like, what? Yeah, so we will look at those you know, boundary extreme cases. But in this case, we'll take a look at something more realistic like this one. Okay, so we want it to be not symmetric, which means Mm, that would make it not symmetric. You know, with just you know zero one in it, it is not anti. It's not symmetric, because in order for the relation to be symmetric, if zero one is here, then one zero should be here as well. And since you know, uh, one zero is not here, it is not symmetric. Okay, fine. What about this one here? Oh, but tack, you know, this means it is now symmetric, which does not meet the requirement of what you want to do over here, which is the counter example. Fine. I just have to add this here. So what is it now? It is once again not symmetric. Okay, so we'll we'll just let it steep a little bit, okay? So I'm just gonna pause here and have you guys to double check and convince that this particular R is not symmetric. The first part seems like it is symmetric. You know, zero one is here, one zero is not here. But ah, okay. I just added two one to be here, but one two is not here. That makes it not symmetric. Because in order for it to be symmetric, we have to look at every single tuple and say the mirror image of that tuple also needs to be in the set. So in this case, yeah, zero one is fine because one zero is here, but two one is not okay because one two is not here. Are we doing okay so far with this example that we know it is not symmetric? And yet at the same time, it is not anti-symmetric. Why is it not anti-symmetric? Choose E to be one, F to be, excuse me, the other way. Choose E to be zero, F to be one. Then E R F is good, right? Because 0, R1 is good. Um, 
FRE is good too because we have one zero here. And yet, zero and one are not the same. So that means it is not anti symmetric. So this is the counter example to show that my earlier claim that not being symmetric automatically implies anti symmetry is not true because I just found a counter example to that. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So this really goes back to the definitions of all of those qualities of a relation. Is there like a word to describe a relation that is like this? It wouldn't just be like neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. It is. This is not symmetric and it is not anti-symmetric. It's the best way to describe okay. it. There's not like a term. No, no, there's no special term to describe it. It's probably not useful. That's why there's no special term to describe it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, well, to kind of look at the silver lining of my earlier mistake, this is a good example of critical thinking. It's like, you know, somebody made a claim, okay? Somebody said, blah, blah, blah is true. And you go like, okay, do I just kind of write it down and take it as it is true? No, you kind of have to think about it, right? So unless I have a concrete proof step by step to show that that is the case, there's always a chance that it is not true. And in order to prove something is not true, you just have to find a single counter example, which I did. So all of those techniques, okay, finding the counter example is something that you have already learned. Based on what you have learned already, given time, obviously, you can come back and say, but tech, what you said earlier is not true because I just came up with a counter example. So that's an application of critical thinking, which is basically the question, is that really true? Yep. Will we ever have a question where we have to prove whether or not uh, proof is true or false? Like, will we ever have a question? Not yet. So we haven't really talked about <laughs> we haven't talked about proof by induction and proof by contradiction. So those are two techniques of proving. So when after we introduce those concepts, then the exam will may include you know, may include a proof question. You know, where you know, I go like blah 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 and blah blah proof that blah 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 is true, but not yet. All right, so are we are we doing okay so far with all these terms you know related to relations? Okay, so here's here's my question to you. Okay, so let me go back to the definitions, and I ask the question of, can you write code? Okay, like in some programming language, I would suggest JavaScript because JavaScript has the notion of a set already, and it can really be useful in this case. So the question is, can you write a subroutine given a you know, set X and a given a set R that it will check this and see whether that, uh, see whether a relation is reflexive or not? That is a question. What do you think? And then the question is, you know, what does that code look like? So if you are looking at this from the perspective of C++, is ugly. That code is going to be ugly. I can tell you that. But from the perspective of JavaScript, depending on what value E can be or what can be in X, if oh, if X can only have, let's say, you know, strings or integers, you know, some kind of primary type instead of a, uh, a compound or a composite type, then the code is actually relatively easy. Um, I'm going to you know, talk about this just a little bit. Because otherwise, this class is all about math and it's not about programming. So I do want to relate it to programming a little bit. Okay, so um, so slash slash, you know, we know that x is a set, and slash slash r is a set of tuples, two tuples. How do we know it is reflexive? Okay. So the way we do it is to say um, let reflexive, okay, I misspelled it, reflexive be 
true to begin with. Okay, so we are finding we're trying to find evidence that it is not true. And so we want to say, actually, I can do this with a loop. I can also do this with just statements. So let me see if I can do it with a statement. All right. I have to cheat because I cannot remember all the primitives or the prototypes of a set. So this is what I do a lot, okay? I look up JavaScript, the set type, and I look into what they call prototype. So these are the methods that are built into the set um, type in JavaScript. So let me see here, right here, that's a good source. All right, so you can see how your JavaScript already has set as a built-in type, and it already has all of these primit primitives you know, defined. Has is basically saying it's, it's the reverse of element of, because when you look at element of, the potential element is on the left-hand side, but in this particular format, the set is on the left-hand side, and then the element or the value that you want to check is on the right-hand side. Okay, so this is really useful. It also has it you know, for each, which means you can go through every single element in a set. It's, an, it's a, basically it's a loop going through all the iterations of all the elements, okay? All right, so based on these two, I think I know how to do this already. So let me go back to the tablet here. So what we can do now is to say reflexive is, and then we say, oh, okay, I take it back, sorry. So don't copy anything just yet. Okay, all right. So the way we do this is to say r x dot for each. Okay. So for each is a method, but when you look at you know what it requires, okay, let me click on this one. It wants to have a, okay, let me look at the syntax here. It has a callback. Does everybody know what a callback is? You're basically um, using a function as a parameter to a method in this case. So you can pass along a way of doing things, so to speak. So in JavaScript syntax, you know, one really kind of shorthand to define a function is simply to say this is parameter x, which is instant lowercase x, I should probably use e instead of x to avoid the confusion. So for this is the parameter, and then it uses this particular symbol not to mean implication, but to say what is following is the body of the function. This is a shorthand. So the function inside, I can just say that uh, reflexive, oops, I cannot spell reflexive. Yeah, come on. Reflexive is reflexive and Okay, it's an and because we have a universal quantifier, which means you know it have all of the conditions have to be true for every element of x. So that's why we have an and. So the question is, what what are we looking for? We need r, okay, which is a set. So r as a set has has h a s as a method, and then you can specify what element you're looking for. I'm not sure whether this will work or not, but you can potentially do this. I think it will work, but I'm not 100% sure. We're looking for uh, e, e in an array. So the square bracket allows you to create an array on the fly, which is basically a two tuple in this case. So, so once again, I'm not really sure if this is going to work because I'm not sure whether you can create whether the built-in uh, has can compare two tuples or not. I'm suspecting it cannot, but the idea is like this. Okay, so I have just created code to implement the same thing as the reflexive property in the notes here. So let me just switch back to the notes. So we switch back to, where's my note? There we go. So this thing here just translates to the code that we see here. Okay, 
Now, I'm not trying to you know teach you guys your know, JavaScript in this class. You know, there's enough content in this class to to begin with already. But basically, the idea is for everyone like these things. I can turn it into JavaScript code. Okay, I can turn this one into JavaScript code. I can also turn this one into JavaScript code. So that's kind of the idea. Okay, you want to relate this to programming. Yep. Sure. I think the best way to do this is to give you an example. So let me go to a command line interface. I think this one works. Okay. Um, we'll just write a simple program. Okay, so put here. Uh, we can call this JS. Okay. So now we just say, you know, um, let x be a new set, and then you can specify the membership of the set using um, an array. So we can just say one, two, three. So now we have a set x, you know, which has one, two, three in it. And then what we can do now is to say x dot for each. So I'm specifying for each element of e, what do we of x, what do we want to do? Um, so this is the way we specify a. Um, what we call an anonymous function, which means the function has no name. It, I'm creating a function on the fly so that it becomes an argument to a method. Yep. This is also called a named expression. Nameless, yep. Mm -hmm. Or a nameless function definition. It is still a function definition. It's just, you know, a... So in this case, I just want to print it out. So we say console.log. And I just want to know what E is. Okay, so we just say E like that. Okay. And then we'll see whether that works or not. So node set.js. There we go. So E is the function that you create on the fly. Huh? So E is the function that you create. No, E is not a function. E is the parameter of the function that I that I'm creating on the fly. In other words, if I cannot use anonymous or nameless zero functions, then I would have to define a function first. Then I have to define a function called, you know, print. Okay, print e. So I would have to define something like this, and then I replace this portion. I replace lines three and four using e print e as a as a name. Okay, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. X dot for each, print E without any parameters. Because you know, basically what is happening is for every element in X, it is applying that element as a argument to call print E, which achieves the same result as this one. So unless print E has, a, has an application somewhere else in a program, I don't want to define a function where it's a one-shot deal. I only have one place that I need the function, so I can you know, I can use the nameless option, which is uh, the earlier version, and then this one here is make it, it makes sense if print e needs to be somewhere else, so I can I, I don't have to copy and paste code. So just to be sure, okay, you know we'll run this code again, so you can see how the first one two three is coming out of the first um, for each, and then the second one two three is coming out of the second for each. How many people know uh, JavaScript already, or at least a little bit of JavaScript? Okay, it's a useful programming language. It's not the best, okay, by lot, not by a long shot, but it's pragmatic. Why is it pragmatic? Why do you think JavaScript is a pragmatic programming language? It's pragmatic. Hmm. Okay, what uses you know what can you use JavaScript for? That becomes the next question. Yep. Uh, applications, like cell phone app applications. Cell phone applications, that is actually true, okay? You know, surprisingly, because you can turn a web application or you can turn a web page into a cell phone application relatively easily. There are frameworks, you know, that makes use of JavaScript, but they all use, you know, uh, they have their own framework, which means the library, the object hierarchy are kind of all different, but they all use JavaScript as a as the programming language. So it's good for web page client side scripting for sure. Okay, what about so if there's client side, what is the other side? Server side. Server side. 
So it can be used, you know, uh, JavaScript on the server side. Absolutely. I just did, right? I just did, okay? Using Node, okay? Node.js, okay? That's server side JavaScript, okay? What if you're interested in Google App Script programming? What do you think Google App Script look like and what do you use it for? Google App Script is JavaScript. And what do you use it for? Uh, to, uh, to automate things, right? To automate things in Google Sheets, to automate things in Google Doc, um, to automate things in Google Drive, okay? So if you want to set up a routine, okay, every month you want to back up these folders into that particular folder over there, you can use JavaScript for that. So Java is simplistic and old to the point where it is rooted everywhere. It's JavaScript, which is not Java. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they are really quite different. Java is strongly typed. It is extremely strongly typed, more so than C and C++, which means if you give it an ambiguous type, it's going to bark at you and go like, I'm not going to do this. Okay, You have to tell me exactly what to do with this particular type because the two values of the equality are not of the same type. I cannot you know, do the compare. Uh, JavaScript will try its best. It's like, oh, I can see you have one, a string on one side, a numerical value on the other side. Let me see. I think you meant to compare these two as numerical values. So I'm going to convert the string into a numerical value first, and then I'll do the compare. It will do it for you, even when you don't want it to do it that way. <laughs> so then JavaScript is mobile version of Java. No, no. <laughs> it's just a different programming language. Okay, the best way to look at this is to say, do not think of JavaScript. Think of it as ECMA script. Yes, so now there's no Java in it. <laughs> Forget about Java, because it has nothing to do with Java, the programming language. Why do they call it JavaScript? I have no idea, and I don't want to know. <laughs> because whatever it is makes no sense. They were talking about it over coffee one day. Hmm? So they were talking about it over coffee one day. <laughs> so if you want to look at what is ACMA script, you know, it actually is an acronym for something. European Committee of blah 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 blah. Yep. Why do I feel like every time I look at a framework or hear about frameworks, they're all in JS. Like well, why are they all like why they, why is it so commonly used? Because it's a client-side programming language. It's the most common client-side, which means you, know, you, you write a script. It runs as a part of your HTML document. So you have Firefox, you have Chrome, you have um, Opera. Hmm? Opera. Opera. Uh, what is the Microsoft browser? Edge. Edge, Edge. which is basically Edge. Chrome. Okay. So, but they all recognize JavaScript. They all implement the same base classes. So that means, you know, once you know the intersection, okay, set concept, right? So once you understand you know, all the, the intersection of all of these browsers, how they implement JavaScript, you can now write the code to, to run inside the browser. So the code inside the browser can do a lot of stuff because they can use DOM, D-O-M, uh, which stands for <laughs> I remember the acronym, but so not the definition. How accessible would a server side script be? Hmm? So how accessible would it be to get a JavaScript into the server? So JavaScript running on the server side is Node.js. So what you do with Node.js program in the context of a web serving app is you're creating an HTML document using code. Okay. So it looks like Netscape changed the name to JavaScript so they could position it as a companion for the Java language. So originally it looks like it was supposed to be made for Tandem, <laughs> um, but it kind of split off and did its own thing. Okay, so that's a that's a good explanation. Yeah, thank you. And Java itself was never intended as what it is now. It was intended as a 
embedded system programming language, you know, that Sun has a, it basically Sun Microsystem, which most of you do not even know, you know, existed, you know, in the past, had a pet project, you know, meaning it, it's not even important. Um, and they were planning to use Java as the programming language for the embedded processor. And it was just a really obscure, tiny little project that nobody cared about. But then later on, it just kind of spun into something else because when they were designing the processor for the embedded system, they decided, okay, we're going to make a virtual machine first you know, to test out the, the language because the silicon is going to take a while to come back. And then later on, there was no silicon whatsoever, but the Java virtual machine stuck. Okay, and then Sun found a way to put it into Netscape, you know, the browser, you know, or you know, to put it as a quote unquote web application thing, you know, because it, it runs across all the platforms. And the uh, the advertisement was Java is good because it runs on all platforms. That was actually true, it's still true, okay. But what they forgot to say is equally slowly. <laughs> that was one of the early, one of the things about Java in the early days was yes, it runs on every single platform, but equally slowly. Because it's a it's, everything is run through a virtual machine. So okay, long history stuff. Anyway, uh, so DOM stuff you know is useful document object model, which means you know from inside a web page like this, okay. The JavaScript inside this web page can change the content basically any way it wants. So you can run, you can basically write a game. Okay, the, the game itself can run inside a browser with no further internet connection necessary. Yeah, that's a Flash. Hmm? Flash. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a much better version of Flash. Yes, Flash just is not very wasn't that good. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, but if you think about it that way, and you know, if ECMAScript, which is what JavaScript came from, has support for the type set, doesn't that tell you something about the usability or the practicality of the concept of sets in actual programming? Okay, so just think about that a little bit, okay? Think about that a little bit. Do other languages... Like not the same way that JavaScript does, because you know, Java has probably a class called set. C++ has a template class called set. Okay, so you can look it up. You'll find out you know, how to use set or map you know, and stuff like that in C++ as a template class. Every time you use a template class, your program gets a lot bigger, because that's basically what templates are. Is you know, it, it's it's kind of like a C++ code generator that is sitting on top of C++, which was originally how templates were done. So every time you say, I want a template class of a set, and inside the angle brackets is a set of integers, it just cranks out like a chunk of, a big chunk of code. Even though you're only using like this much of what you need with, with the set notation, it gives you this chunk of code. And that's partially why C++ is really not a very efficient language when it comes to um, imp the implementation of set. Anything that uses template class is not efficient, basically. Anyway, any other questions about relations? I kind of digressed. Okay, so if there are no questions about relations, the next topic that we are going to go through, does anyone read ahead of me and know what is the next topic? Propositional logic. Okay, now that is a big topic. Not relations. <laughs> Not relations. That's a really tiny one. So we are now on to propositional logic. And the propositional logic slide is complex. Okay, and there are several ways to go about you know, looking at propositional logic. The first one is mechanically, okay, what is it? And the second one is philosophically what it is, what it is. So from this class perspective, we are not going to take the philosoph philosophical perspective. We are going to look at this from the perspective of computer science. In other words, why is this important? Why are topics like this important to us? 
So propositional logic, along with predicate logic, is all about proving theorems. Okay. So how many of you have taken linear algebra and some of the other classes where there are a lot of proofs to do? Do you guys enjoy proving theorems? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Let's do it. I actually learned it on my free time right now. Okay. So what is that? Okay, proving theorems have anything to do with computer science? Because people look at proving theorems as, oh, that's a thing that mathematicians do. I just want to write a game. Why do I need to learn about proving theorems? So why do why indeed? What do you think? What is what is your your answer to that question? Because we work based off of logic, and so whenever you're building something, you have to determine as like how something might go awry. And, mm hmm. Uh, yep. Do you have logical basis behind us to like, oh, this won't ever go into this range because of some reasoning behind it, then yep. it uh, allows you to narrow down your selection or whatever, not have yep. to worry about that extra chunk. Yep. So one prime example of what can go wrong when we don't do this is called the hard bleed uh, vulnerability. Okay, so we'll take a look at the hard you know, bleed bug. And this one has to do with the basic SSL uh, secured socket, secure socket layer, you know, which is a really crucial part of encrypting, you know, um, transmission. You know, HTTPS is based on SSL. Um, SFTP is, well, that one is not based on SSL. But most of the web communication, you know, that is encrypted is based on SSL. So the the bug itself, okay, it actually has a much better site than this one. I think that's the correct one. But if you look at Wikipedia, it will tell you about your know, heart bleed as well. So this is basically saying that somebody, you know, the, whoever wrote the library, which is OpenSSL, did not factor in all the possible ways of people can make a request. Okay, and it's very common. Okay, because you know, when you write code, okay, this is the RFC. Okay, this is the this is the standard of this particular protocol, and you know these are the parameters. So how do you write your code? You naturally assume that people will give you a properly formed packet or the properly formed request. That's what most people do, right? You know, we assume, okay, the header part only has 24 characters and followed by a description. It has 255 characters, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you would program and parse the input based on the assumption that it is properly formatted. So the question is, what if the input is not properly formatted? What is your program going to do? So without that consideration, in certain cases, like in this one, the, um, the request, the reply to the request, would actually show um, the requester a quote unquote random window into the memory of the program, which can include you know, cryptographic you know, secrets for other people who are using the same website. So it's a it's a it's a very significant exposure, you know, in terms of computer security, and you know, bad things, really bad things, can happen. Okay, so now you look at this and go like, okay, I I don't see how this relates to proofing theorems. Okay, so what do you think is the connection between this and proving theorems? Well, what if you can describe mathematically and say, regardless of how the request is formatted, I'm not going to do something stupid? That's a big ask. Yep, that's a big you know, statement you know, that you're not going to do something stupid. Okay, you would double check everything first, right? So if the request is malformed, then you simply reply and say, okay, this request is not formatted correctly. I'm not even going to process it. Okay. And what if you can prove, okay, I give you a chunk of C code, the library C code of OpenSSL, and the computer, the AI, okay, because people like to use the term AI, and then the AI can analyze the code from the beginning based on the assumption of the request and prove to you once and for all that this code will do what you expect it to do. If the request doesn't make sense, it will reject it. If it is correct, then it will do what it is supposed to do. What if you can prove 
once and for all mathematically that a piece of code would do what it is supposed to. Isn't that great? Because now you don't have to throw individual test cases against the program because now you can mathematically prove it. But who wants to do this proof? The library probably has, let's just say, let's, let's do a very you know, uh, modest estimation of 50,000 lines. Do you want to prove the behavior of a 50,000 line program is correct? Nope. Now, most of that work is not difficult, okay? You know, it's just extremely tedious. So that's why you know, there's a field in AI, okay, or at least previously it is in the domain of AI. It's called automated um, program verification. Yes, it is. Now, those people actually do make a lot of money. So the dream of mechanical verifier is as old as computer science itself. However, only in the last few decades have we seen a major breakthrough toward making it a reality. That has to do with the hardware. Okay, If you think about it, how much processing power do I have on my Fitbit? By today's standard, you go like, not a whole lot. Your, your cell phone can probably run circles around my fit, my Fitbit, and then your desktop computer can run circles around your, your cell phone, and so on, right? But I'm going to bet you that my Fitbit has more processing power than a computer in the 50s, yeah. which takes up multiple rooms, right? You know, when you turn that thing on, the whole city dims. <laughs> and my Fitbit can run circles around it any day. And it can do it for hours, days, okay? So that is what has changed, okay? So now we have the processing power to do that. <clears throat> so there's an entire field dedicated to automatic or automated program verification, which is based on theorem proving. So this is one of the reasons why this stuff is actually important to us because we, we want to get this done. We want to achieve automated program verification, at least to critical parts of an operating system. There are certain parts of an operating system that go like, eh, okay, this part can crash and it's not a big deal. But there are other parts of an operating system, like the encryption engine and stuff like that, that you really want to make sure that it gets the job done correctly, or not to do it at all. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is the perspective, that's the angle that we are looking at you know, from, you know, in this class, your case, because, you know, this whole topic can be taught in many different ways. And in some other classes, you know, it is strictly from a perspective of philo philosophy, because you know, all of this stuff here is nothing new. It's thousands of years old, okay, at least two, okay, or three, because the Greeks, you know, thought of your propositional logic already. So the next question is, what is a proof? When you have a proof in linear algebra, what are you actually doing? I mean, from the abstract perspective, yeah. You're showing how to, uh, how to, never mind. How to get point to be. Yeah. Okay. You're basically taking every single test that you could sit there meticulously do, and you're putting it into a well-formed, like, uh, description, yeah. Okay. So, very good. I mean, those are all, you know, basically from the exposure that you have up to this point in a math class, that's what the proof looks like, right? You know, mechanically, that's what it looks like. But from the mathematical perspective, what it is, is you have certain types of axioms, okay? So you got axioms, and then you have your know, things that are given to you in a question. So I'm just going to call these you know, axioms. And these are things from the question itself. So question facts, okay? Okay, so the question is, okay, can you establish a certain statement and prove that this certain statement here, I'll call this the proposed theorem, proposed. Can you make a chain of implication? That's basically what the proof is. It is a mesh of implications. 
So that means, you know, oh, from these two, we can imply this is true. And then from these two, we can imply this is true. I'm just using this as an example, obviously. And then from these two, we can imply this is true. And then when we throw this in, along with this axiom here, we can show this is true. And then between these two, I can show this is true. And then that can show this is true. So every link in this case has to be at least an implication, preferably if and only if, but you can, if you can only manage, manage if, that's fine. So all of these are implications. And this is also why implication is really important in a class like this or classes that depend on this class because a proof is really just a mesh, okay, M-E-S-H mesh of implications. What you're really trying to do is to establish a connection or a connection from everything that is known, okay, the axioms, the facts that are given to you in the question, the assumptions, and you just need to form a mesh and work your way all the way to the theorem that usually is also part of the question. Because in most linear algebra you know, questions that involve a proof, they will say, prove that blah, 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 given blah, 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 right? So the given blah, blah, blah is on this side, and then the theorem that you're really asked to prove is on this side. It is really asking you, can you make this mash happen? That is a mathematical proof. Are we still doing okay so far with the concept of what a proof is? So for those of you who have you know, taken classes uh, that involves your know, proving theorems, can you tell me what is the difficulty of, you know, of a proof? Finding those bridges that take you to the theorem. And why is that difficult? Because there are so many different laws and mm -hmm. rules like that you kind of have to sift through that it's just like the quantity. Yep. Is exactly. So what Jacob is saying is at any point, okay, you have a huge number of potential things that you can imply. They're all, I mean, the, the application of a axiom to imply something is not difficult. It's just that you have so many possibilities and you don't know which one would eventually lead you to the theorem that you want to get to, okay? Um, I will conclude this class with an analogy, okay, which I will use again and again. The whole space of what you can imply, think of that as your haystack. The theorem that you want to prove is your needle. So in other words, you're trying to find a needle in a haystack. Now, if the haystack is large, okay, but nonetheless finite, and you know whether the needle is in the haystack, you just want to know whether the needle is in the haystack or not, it's usually just tedious, okay? You just have to kind of go, like, ah, okay, we just have to search in a haystack, right? You know, spend time to do it. The problem with proof is that space or the haystack itself is infinitely large. <laughs> so think about this problem. You have an infinitely large haystack, and I give you the description of a needle, and I'm asking you to find it. So you have no idea whether the needle is really not in the haystack, which means the theorem that I told you is not really a theorem, or that you have not gotten to it yet, because the haystack itself is infinitely large. Is that like Schrodinger's theorem? Hmm? Is that like Schrodinger's theorem? Uh, that's a whole different thing, okay? <laughs> okay, so in this class, we'll talk about how to do this in an automatic way, automated your manner, and on top of that, we'll talk about the technique to make sure the haystack is finite to begin with. So because once you know that haystack is finite, you can systematically search through the entire haystack. Yes, it's gonna take time, but you will conclude at some point whether the needle is there or not. Okay, so that's kind of the trajectory of this entire discussion, and we'll come back you know, next Monday, because Wednesday is our exam, first exam. So next Monday, we'll come back and start to get into the mechanical aspect of propositional logic. All right, so I will see you guys on Wednesday, and remember, it is exam one. Bring your paper, okay, to write your answer on. Uh, you can bring anything that's on paper. 
Okay, just no electronic device during the exam. And if you want office hour, I still have office hour tomorrow, and also office hour before the exam on Wednesday. Uh, and then for the test, mm -hmm. it's up to the Aleph No module or. It is up to and including the.